I'm here right now with Ramsey Sprague. He's also one of the spokespeople for the Tar Sands Blockade Movement, and you guys have been some of the busiest activists around lately. But you're here specifically to tell us a story of your home city of Houma and what happened and why you got involved into the movement. Give us a little background. Right. Well, I was born in Houma, Louisiana. My family is from a little further south of there in a town called Dulac. These are primarily Indian areas occupied by folks like the, the Houma Nation and the Biloxi Chitamacha Confederation. Um, my particular familial heritage in the area is Biloxi Chitamacha Confederation and um, the, specifically the Grand Caillou um, Dulac Band. And having grown up knowing that I was um, Native American but not being extraordinarily connected to my culture or to Louisiana uh, or my family there, I always just kept my um, heart very oriented towards um, the stories I was told in, in elementary school and uh, middle school and high school um, about American history and where my family and my people fit in. I traveled to Guatemala pursuing a um, closer relationship to the indigenous here in Texas that I feel by and large speak um, Spanish. Um, so went to Guatemala to learn Spanish and fell in love with Guatemala to the extent that I stayed there for seven months and organized in the rural countryside and learned about Canadian extraction companies um, doing some really horrendous um, extraction policies like cyanide leaching with gold mines they would um, take an entire hillside and crush it into a pulp and then run cyanide through it and the liquid that would come out would contain uh, dissolved gold and that's how they got these uh, these gold mines up and running of course the cyanide is uh, very volatile and ends up in the water supply right exactly how did they dispose of that cyanide I'm not an expert on the process, but I, I did meet a lot of um, indigenous people in the highlands who, the, the highlands is not were not their traditional lands. They were actually forced into the highlands after um, years of civil war and, and conquest and colonialization of the more fertile uh, Boca Costa and, and um, the coffee regions. So these are displaced peoples already who are being further displaced by what is now sought underneath the mountains and in these dry highlands. Um, the water is completely crucial and that's why they settled around these springs um, in, in these particular areas and the gold mines are um, the practice of the gold mines and the, uh, the dynamiting of the land not only destroys their homes but has uh, sucked the, the wells dry to the extent that they have to have water chucked in um, and the water that flows is now contaminated and other villagers and other areas and the surrounding areas won't buy their produce and their, their animals and, and crops are failing because of the contamination. Um, and there's a lot of violence that occurs in protection of the gold mines, and these are Canadian companies. So you you have seen firsthand in the third world countries the uh, destructive practices that are going on, especially for people who can't really protect themselves or gain from any of this profit, is that right? Precisely. The, just to put a name to it, uh, yeah. San Miguel Ixtehuacan is the community that I've visited. Um, and the gold mine there is called the Marlin Mine. Uh, it is, um, it's a terrible thing to see. Oh, I, I can't even imagine. So, of course, when the opportunity arose here in Texas, my, uh, where I was raised, to stand up to a Canadian extraction company that was contaminating indigenous people in Canada... I jumped at the opportunity and began organizing with Tar Sands Blockade in a very serious and, you know, full-on way in East Texas, um, building our campaign of civil disobedience against the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline, which is designed to facilitate uh, an expansion of the exploitation of the tar sands in, in Alberta, Canada. Why? Why? Is Do you, the supporters of the pipeline think it's important to bring... Um, 
this tar sands oil, as it is, all the way across the, the United States to factories here in, in Texas. Why is that their deal? The refinery and co- refining capacity of Houston and Port Arthur is massive. It's the largest refining capacity in, in the continent and one of the largest in the world. To be able to bring um, massive amounts of tar sands bitumen from Canada to here would allow for the expansion of the rate of exploitation of these strip mines that are contaminating um, massive swaths of land in, in Alberta, Canada. Um, the process, of course, is really alarming, and, and you can go to dirtytarsands.org and see just uh, endless images of the um, the destruction, which are very haunting and uh, unbelievable to a great extent. And of course, uh, we uh, have been hearing a lot about a lot of the things that the activists have been doing. Diane, of course, in her hunger strike, and uh, Bobby Lindsay, and and it, it's it is truly seems to be a grassroots movement. Are you beginning to feel? I mean, here we are in the oil patch, but are you beginning to feel that people are kind of saying, "Yeah, you're right." Are you getting support, especially from these landowners in East Texas? Absolutely. Actually, um, well before we began organizing as Tar Sands Blockade, there were groups that were from East Texas, uh, most notably STOP, which is an acronym for Stop Tar Sands Oil Permanently. Um, That group did a lot of grassroots outreach all up and down the the length of the pipeline, the proposed route of the pipeline, and created this uh, more or less this bed of acceptance for what was to come should the pipeline start construction. Right. So when the pipeline started and, and our acts of civil disobedience began, it wasn't an entirely unforeseen circumstance uh, in East Texas. And we found a tremendous amount of support in the local communities therein where STOP has done a lot of work and outreach educating the local population. Of course, public officials remain very uh, silent or pro-KXL. But um, the public, by and large, from business owners to, you know, grandmothers and sewing circles are very aware that this pipeline is a bad deal. And um, regardless of political orientation, left or right, conservative or liberal, they find themselves knowing um, and believing that this pipeline is a a raw deal for not only East Texas, but for everybody. Are you um, speaking, I guess, uh, from yourself, for yourself? Are you surprised at the turn of President Obama's now forceful belief that the pipeline should continue? Is this a surprise to you all after the election? No. Um, We at Tar Sands Blockade saw the writing on the wall a long time ago and began organizing uh, independently of uh, some of the larger green NGOs that Mm -hmm. tend to think of themselves more as Democratic Party strategists. Um, and don't stand up, didn't stand up to President Obama when he endorsed and expedited the southern leg in an election year. Um, It's very unfortunate that that occurred, but it's very fortunate that people like us were there to step into that void and begin doing the organizing um, that these groups completely neglected. Like I said, the area was ripe. Right. for funds, for legislative action to come in and, and begin actually creating a, a firm bed of resistance to the petrochemical industry in East Texas, at least an international petrochemical industry. We love our Texas oil, of course. Because <laughs> it's better. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, um, we're there now. Tar Sands Blockade is there now, and, and uh, we're expanding and growing and expanding and growing our scope of what type of work we're setting out to do. Now, uh, two things I want to talk about. First of all, you have had activists who have chained themselves to some of these pipelines. Uh, What was one of the the things that they said as far as the quality of these pipelines that were about to go into the ground? Right. um, TransCanada, the pipeline corporation that owns Keystone XL, and Michaels, the contractor, the lead contractor for two segments of the KXL Southern segment, and there's a third contractor, um, a third company named Sunland, 
who's handling the contract from Lufkin South to Port Arthur and Houston. Um, these Michaels in particular is thought of as the lead or best pipeline builders, contractors in the country, um, in the business. TransCanada has claimed over and over again that this pipe is the safest pipeline ever built. Um, on December 3rd, three activists named Glenn, Matt, and Isabel climbed into a segment of pipe at just outside of Winona, Texas, um, near Tyler. And they did so overnight. When they woke up just past sunrise, Isabel noticed that she was ringed by sunlight coming in from the outside on a girth. Um, now, there are two different kinds of welds for these pipes. There's a spiral weld that happens in the factory, and then there's a girth weld that connects two rods. And she was just just happened to be resting on a girth and noticed this ring of light. So she quickly snapped some photographs just as the police were arriving, and um, a, a really terrible, violent scene occurred where um, Matt's arm could have been ripped off when they tried to remove the barricade mm -hmm. that he was locked to. Um, the chain that was holding him to the barricade was broken, but the video of it is really horrific and, and quite traumatizing to watch, hearing him scream in pain. Oh. Well, speaking of that kind of courage, you have uh, the, the Tar Sands Blockade has been having some training sessions for other people who would like to be activists. Is that right? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we've we've done trainings. Uh, we've had three mass trainings so far, um, at which well, each one is escalation in terms of uh, participants. Mm -hmm. um, we've recently turned our sights to not so much focus on direct action on the KXL easement on the route itself, uh, partially because we are now injuncted against taking mm -hmm. action right. or trespassing on that due to a slap suit. Uh, but also because we also understand that people around the country are dedicated to ending tar sands exploitation, and they don't want the southern segment to happen as much as we don't. But we cannot expect people to give up their lives and come down to Texas to plug into a movement and perhaps get arrested in Texas. Uh, there are other ways to put pressure on these corporations by looking at their investors and, and holding them accountable as well. Uh, TransCanada's investors are, yeah, some of them have very um, people-friendly and, and uh, very clean public images. Mm -hmm. And of course, TransCanada's image is anything but clean. The tar sands are anything but clean. So to, to put pressure on them through, you know, perhaps what would be called free market activism or corporate accountability activism um, is another way that we can stop the KXL and people can plug into that struggle um, in their homes and rise up and defend their homes from their homes at tarsandsblockade.org forward slash local underscore action. Um, and that's a link right off of our front page. People can go to our front page and just click on take action and find more information there about offices locally in their communities. It's great, Ramsey. So again, it's tarsandsblockade.org for more information. You can always find out what's happening there as well. Uh, just go to their front page and then follow the links from everything else. Anything else you'd like to say to the audience? Sure. Well, while circling around to our uh, Ecuadorian friends, um, my tribe, the Biloxi Chitamacha Confederation, and the Homa Nation and the tribes of southern Louisiana are an amalgamation of many tribes um, after forced removal after the Trail of Tears, the area wasn't highly sought after by um, the United States, and we were more or less permitted to occupy these areas and not forcefully removed. The bayous didn't hold a lot of riches. Um, that was until oil and gas was ex ex uh, discovered there. Right, of course. So I relate very closely to the story of indigenous lands being taken for oil and gas exploration without consultation. Um, there are newspaper articles of my grandfather, Sambo Fitch, going back to the 60s, claiming that we're Chittimacha people, we deserve federal recognition, and we deserve to, to have a say in what's happening, um, speaking directly to the, the oil and gas and petrochemical 
powers that swept into the area and soon unleashed a torrent of uh, environmental devastation that is undoing uh, southern Louisiana's culture as we speak. I believe we're losing four football fields worth of land every hour due to um, sea level rise and erosion, um, primarily due to the destruction of the the barrier islands and the wetlands because of the incursion of uh, oil tankers Mm -hmm. into the region. Well, Ramsey, thank you so much for joining me today. I do appreciate it. We've been speaking with Ramsey Sprigg. He is a spokesperson and volunteer and activist with Tar Sands Blockade, and you can always go to their website for more information or to their Facebook page. It's Tar Sands Blockade. Thank you for joining us today.